This is the new Toyota Corolla, and it's a little bit like the Russian city of St. Petersburg. They both had their names changed to alter their image, but that didn't really work, so they went back to their original names. St. Petersburg was called Leningrad for a while. The Toyota Corolla was called the Auris for a while. You know, this is Toyota's answer to the Ford Focus and the Volkswagen Golf, but the starting price is just a little bit more than those cars. So yeah, it starts from £21,000, but you can save almost £2,000 on one through CarWow. Now, if you want to see how much you can save on a new car, or to just make sure you're paying the right price for a car you're looking at, click up there on the pop-out banner in the top right corner of the screen, or on the link below the video to go to CarWow. You can check out our latest deals from our reputable dealers. Now, the Iris and the old Toyota Corolla before it had a reputation for being worthy but dull cars. But look at this one. It's not. It's exciting. I mean, this is the range topping version, so you have stuff like bigger wheels and some shinier bits of trim. The lesser models aren't quite so swanky, but they are still pretty cool looking. And the grille, it stands out. You've got these sleek headlamps. Oh my gosh, a Toyota hatchback that is interesting to look at. Please, please, please continue on the inside, will it? Oh yes, they have. I really, really like the look of this interior. It's got so much unique style to it. Quality is pretty good as well. It's all nice and squidgy. Things feel solid too. And then there's the switches. They're nicely damped. Even the climate control switches, nice feel to them. Metal edges on them as well. You've got sweeping metal trim here, metal effect trim here. But then there are a few Toyotaisms. For instance, this bit of plastic here is cheap. Hmm. Also, what's with this difference between the dash and the door top? I mean, I could probably store a bottle of water up there. Yes, I can. <laughs> and then there's this, look. So this is super squidgy, this armrest. Really nice when you're driving, but this central armrest is hard as you like. And then there's some other Toyotaisms, the way buttons are grouped in a kind of random fashion. Down here's all your driving buttons. Yet over here, there are some more driving related buttons. And the automatic high beam function is over there, yet the rest of the lights are up here on the stalk. Hmm. And then there's this look. So this is an area, I think, for your mobile phone, but it doesn't fit a mobile phone particularly well. In terms of the other storage, look, you can fit bottles in there. The storage under here isn't so great. There is a 12 volt socket. The door bins are okay. I can just about fit a really big bottle in them, so it's passable. And the glove box, if you try and hurry it, it goes, no! I'll take my own time, thank you very much. Can't fault the driving position though, it's absolutely brilliant. It usually is on Toyotas, to be fair. Decent amount of adjustment in the steering wheel. And of course, you can alter the height of the driver's seat if you're short and push it all the way down if you're very, very tall. And then there's plenty of headroom and you can slide it all the way back as well. So it's not a problem to get comfortable. And my favorite thing about these seats, classic Toyota again, is this the release mechanism for the backrest so you can just go straight down and back up without having to do it on a ratchet like you have to on most european cars another thing i love is the steering wheel itself it feels quite expensive and it's leather coated regardless of which model you go for and that brings me on to the car's equipment list the corolla range kicks off with the icon and it gets an eight inch touchscreen heated seats with adjustable lumbar support for the driver and dual zone climate control. There's also semi-autonomous driving tech. So it's a cruise control system, which will use radar technology to keep you safe distance from the car in front. And it'll even steer to keep you safely in lane. And it's amazing that you get that right across the range. The next level up is Icon Tech, and that adds some extra gadgets such as parking sensors, a reversing camera, and auto park. So it'll do the steering for you to get you into space. It also adds inbuilt satellite navigation for the infotainment system and a larger digital screen for the driver, which shows more more information than the standard smaller screen. To all that, the design adds some styling upgrades such as rear privacy glass. Excuse me. You also get some side skirts to make it look more sporty. It also adds LED fog lights. At the top of the range is the XL, which is what this car is, and it has 18 inch alloy wheels, by LED headlights, and a snazzy satin surround for the grill. There's comfy body hugging sports seats too, and red stitching on the dash. And keyless, entry. However, all these extras are a little bit superfluous. Really, the sweet spot in the range is the Icon Tech, as it has all the kit you really need. The last thing to talk about here in the front is the tech itself. 
So the infotainment system isn't very high resolution, but at least it's colourful. The menus are laid out clearly and you get plenty of physical shortcut buttons, which is handy. Also, it's pretty logical, but the screen isn't very responsive to your touch. It can be a bit slow. You can control certain things with voice commands, but it's very limited what you can actually do with it. It is easy to input a destination into the sat nav, but it takes a while for the system to calculate a route and to add a waypoint. Now, for me, the biggest problem with this infotainment system is the fact that it doesn't come with Apple CarPlay nor Android Auto. However, it will be added in future, and if you buy a car now, you'll be able to have it retrofitted. Moving on to the digital driver's display, you can look through different menus and go through different functions. However, the information you can see on there isn't quite as extensive as you can get with VW's digital driver's display on the Golf, though you do have to pay extra for that. Now, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of the Volkswagen Golf, especially because it's got a better infotainment system, click up there on the pop-up banner in the top right hand corner of the screen or on the link below the video. Now let's move on to the Aris's back seat and the first thing to note is that the rear doors don't open all that wide. Another thing is that well it's just a little bit more cramped in the back in terms of knee room than its key competitors. Headroom that's all right ish. The main problem is this the sloping roof line. So when you look to the right, you're just staring at that, and the window seems quite low down. So that all makes it feel a bit dark and dingy in here, especially with this black interior trim. One saving grace is that the rear windows do go all the way down. Though the materials here are hard plastics, though it's the same story in the back of a Volkswagen Golf. Though this armrest here is absolutely lovely, so it's quite good to just lean on if you're on a longer journey. But what about if you need to carry three people at once? Well, there's not too big a hump in the floor. The middle seat, when just sat here on your own, is just about all right. However, with two people either side of you, the narrow body means that it feels really cramped for shoulder space. Also, the people on the outer seats will have a bigger problem with that sloping roof line because their heads will be rubbing up against it. And if they've got long legs, they'll really notice that limited rear knee room as well. I also want to point out this, yes, you do have an armrest, a couple of cup holders, which is quite handy. What is missing from here though, is any kind of like charging ports in the rear. It's like kids are gonna be back here and they're gonna to wanna to charge their mobile devices. You do have some back seat pockets which are a bit flimsy, but we'll hold an iPad. In terms of fitting a child seat though, well, yeah, the Isofix covers, they're quite easy to remove. Fitting the child seat itself is okay, but it's hard to maneuver it into the back seats. Once again, because of those rear doors are quite small and because of the limited space back here. And if you have two child seats in the back, there's no way you can fit someone in between them. Right, fine, let's talk about the boot. So in terms of the actual capacity, it's a little bit smaller than a Volkswagen Golfs and a Vauxhall Astra's and quite a bit smaller than a Honda Civic. In fact, if you want to see my review of a Honda Civic, click up there on the pop-out banner in the top right-hand corner of the screen or on the link below the video. Anyway, for most people, this size will still be just about okay. Now, yeah, I should point this out. Look, there is a bit of a load lip here and the bump extends quite away, so you do have to hoik things out and over. But this boot, as it is, doesn't tell the whole story. If you can notice here, there, there's some ridges. So you can get this car with a space saver spare wheel and then you get a cover and then there is no boot lip really because then you get this false floor. Without it though, look, when I fold the rear seats down, you get this huge ridge, which isn't ideal, is it? So yeah, speak to your dealer and make sure you get that thing fitted. In terms of other practical features though, yeah, there's some tie down hooks there and there. There's also a little hook there where you can hang a shopping bag off. Now, with the seats folded, there is space for a bike with its wheels attached. Also, two large boxes will fit across the back seats and there's space for eight smaller boxes and a couple of soft bags, so it's actually all right. And if you put the seats back up, underneath the load cover, there's space for one large suitcase, one small suitcase, and if you want to fit a baby buggy, it'll go there on its side as well. You'll easily fit a set of golf clubs in the boot as well, but there's no place to store the load cover if you want to take out the car. So yeah, you can either leave it there or just do what I sometimes do and just chuck them into the bushes like that. Now then, it's time for the car wow five annoying things about this car. The definition of the reversing camera is pretty low resolution and there's guidelines for parking. They don't actually move when you turn the steering wheel, so they're not actually that much help. If you have the two litre hybrid version of this car, because the engine is slightly bigger, the 12 volt battery has to be moved from the front to the rear, which means it actually eats into the boot space. You have a, a bit less load capacity, and so there's no way I'll be able to sit quite so comfortably. In most cars, if you want to turn off the parking sensor so it stops beeping, such as when you're filming about how bad the reversing camera is, you just press a button. On this car though, you have to go into a menu 
you use the buttons on the steering wheel and turn it off that way and it's all a little bit of a faff. You don't get door bins here in the back, just a cup holder. So you can only fit like a bottle or a cup in there. However, it actually says for you not to fit a cup. Huh? For quite an aggressive looking car, it has a really wimpy sounding horn. Listen to this. It's a little bit like, oh, sorry, would you mind getting out of the way? It's not all negative though. Here's five good things about this car. This little thin here near the door mirror, and another one integrated into the headlight help reduce wind turbulence so you get less wind whistle when you're driving on the motorway. A lot of cars of this size have a torsion beam rear suspension where the two rear wheels are joined by a beam and that means they're not so good at going over bumps because they are attached. More expensive versions of certain cars of this size have independent rear suspension. However, all versions of the Toyota Corolla have independent rear suspension so they're just better at riding down the road smoothly. Oh, yeah, this new Corolla is 60% stiffer in its body than the old Aris and that should make it feel more sturdy. The car gets loads of the latest safety kit to stop you having an accident. For instance, it will automatically brake if it thinks you're going to reverse into something such as your presenter. You get a five-year warranty, which is two years better than most manufacturers offer. Plus, Toyotas do have a reputation for being pretty reliable anyway. You can get the Toyota Corolla with three different engine choices. So the entry-level one is a 1.2-litre turbo petrol, and that's fine for just nipping around town. But I reckon you're better off upgrading, spend an extra £2,000 for the 1.8 litre hybrid, which is what this is. So you've got an electric motor and a battery to help boost the economy and give you tax busting emissions. Now, the engine isn't the fastest, not 16, just under 11 seconds. So if you want a bit more performance, you can get a 2 litre hybrid version, which gives you economy and decent performance, 0 to 60 in just under eight seconds. So yeah, quite quick actually. However, it will cost you an extra 4,000 pounds. So it's probably not worth doing. Now, what is worth doing is going onto CarWow and plugging in the details of the car you want. So I've plugged in the details of this 1.8 litre hybrid XL version of the Corolla. And I've got an offer back from one of our reputable dealers for £25,000, so a saving of two grand over list. So if you're thinking about buying a car such as this, go and check out our configurator to make sure you're getting a good deal. And you can do that just by clicking that pop-out banner up there or by following the link below the video or just Google Toyota Corolla Car Wow. Let's see what this new Toyota Corolla is like to drive in town. So one of the best things for me about this hybrid version is that you can drive around at slower speeds on electric power alone for short distances. So it's really super quiet. And then if you need a burst of speed, the engine comes in to provide some added propulsion. It's all quite smooth. Of course, you've got the automatic gearbox, which is just smooth as well. And so the suspension over bumps, it's not bad at all. Yeah, speed humps aren't an issue in town. Even really bad surfaces such as this here don't upset the car that much. It just deals with them without fidgeting too much. Right, and let's see what this Corolla is like to park. Now, as you're slowing down, the first bit of braking actually recharges the batteries and that can make the brakes feel a little bit grabby. What I'm gonna do is put the auto parking on so it's looking that way for the space. Let's see when it finds it. But I'll put it into reverse now. Take my hands off the wheel and the car should automatically park. Let's see how it gets on this system. It's telling me to carry on going backwards. The sensors are doing their thing and it's got it into space. There we go. And then stop and forwards. Oh, I just want to try something. There we go. Yes, it did it. Thank God! It applied the brakes automatically because it thought I was going to hit the vehicle in front and I could have got into that space quite easily myself. Yeah, trust me. Now, if I had been doing it myself, one of the issues I might have had is the fact that the visibility from these pillars isn't great. There's quite a thick rear pillar there as well. Finally, let's check the maneuverability by going round this mini roundabout. So this Corolla actually has quite a tight turning circle. It's a little bit better than on something like a Volkswagen Golf. So yeah, it makes it really easy to just like nip about in traffic around town and do U-turns and stuff. This new Corolla is really comfy to drive on the motorway. So the seats, yeah, they're great. It's quiet really as well, not too much wind noise or road noise. The only problem is, is when you put your foot down in a hybrid. So listen to this. So I need to overtake someone, 50 miles an hour to come on to 70. That's 70. Now, it wasn't the fastest, but it wasn't the slowest either, but that noise you get from the automatic gearbox or the hybrid, it does just kind of drone on a little bit. 
still what I can't fault is the economy. So I've done quite a few miles in this car, mixture of town and motorway driving, and I've averaged 58 miles per gallon. So yeah, you do not need a diesel. That is impressive. For me, the biggest surprise about this Toyota Corolla is what happens when you get on a twisty road because it's actually really good. So it steers sharply, it stays flat, it grips well in the corners. It's not quite as sporty feeling as a Ford Focus, but this is a car that people who enjoy driving will enjoy driving. Now, if you want to be sure you're paying a fair price on a Toyota Corolla, click on the pop-out banner just up there in the top right-hand corner of the screen or follow the link below the video to get a car wow, to check out the best offers from our trusted Toyota dealers. So then, what's my final verdict on the Corolla? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, it's not completely perfect, but it's still a really, really good car. And if you're looking for a great value hybrid hatchback, yeah, you should just go right ahead and buy it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Now, did you agree with my verdict? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to turn your notifications on. If you want to watch another video, check out my in-depth review of the Ford Focus down there or down there for my review of the Volkswagen Golf versus the Focus and the Kia Seed. And if you want to see how much you can save on a Toyota Corolla, almost said Aventis then, click on the box over there to make sure you're paying a good price.